I would like to take this opportunity to express my delight that you have all come here in this way, meaning that you have come here in order to study Dhamma. I will do everything that I can to help you to be successful in this endeavor. At this first stage, I would like to tell you all that the genuine and true fruit of the study of Dhamma is to realize a new life. This new life is something we must have. It is something completely opposite to the old way of life. This word new is ambiguous. For example, we use it to say a new car or even a new wife, which isn't really true. It's the same old car in the same old wife. The new we're talking about must be completely opposite to the old. This new life is completely different from the old life. That old life is trapped within the power and influence of positivism and negativism. So the new life must be out from under that power and be free of positivism and negativism. Most people aren't willing to believe that this is possible. Most, most people can accept that we can have a life that is free and independent from the positive and the negative. If you're not quite willing to accept this right now, then please at least be willing to listen carefully and with an open mind. To be a real Christian, to be a good and correct Christian, is to have the new life. But none of you are good and correct Christians. You're all trapped. You, you haven't listened to God's commandment. And so when God said not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you didn't listen. And for this reason, you are now trapped under the power of good and evil. Please listen to what God has said and start to follow his commandment in order to be a real Christian, in order to have the new life. Nowadays, all Christians have eaten this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so all so-called Christians are trapped under the power of good and evil. So where can we find a real Christian these days? Even in the teachings of Jesus Christ himself, there is nothing about this very important matter. There's nothing about removing the influence of good and evil. There are only teachings about loving ones, fellow human beings, and so forth. So let's go back to the original commandment of God, the first words of God which appear in the Bible, and let's practice according to them. And then we will also have the heart of Buddhism. Let's go back and review this original commandment of God. God told Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam and Eve went and ate it, and all human beings since are eating this fruit as well. And so we've become deluded by, we've 
gotten lost, become trapped in good and evil. We've all gotten all caught up in these good and evil. And for this reason, we all must die. God warned that if anyone ate this fruit, the result would be death. And so all of us who are eating this fruit must die. Die in this place means to experience tukkha, dukkha, suffering, that which torments the heart and mind. The good or the positive is not peace, and the bad or the negative is not peace either. Both of these are just their different aspects of trouble and fuss and disturbance, and neither of them are peaceful. True peace has nothing to do with good and evil. Real peace is beyond good and evil. If we're interested in peace, we must go beyond this thing, these things good and evil. Therefore, if you're a real Christian already, there's no need for you to come and study Buddhism, because Buddhism also aspires to transcend good and evil. If you've, if you've already done this, then there's no point in studying Buddhism. Now all of you have eaten that fruit. It's in your bellies. And for this reason, you have committed the original sin, and for that sin, you all must die. But if you're wise, you will search for the medicine that will cause you to vomit that fruit up so that you will be free of it. And that medicine is Buddhism. When we have taken this medicine which makes us vomit up this toxin, this poison, then we are emancipated. Emancipated is to have passed beyond to be liberated from all that good and evil. So thus it is that we, we study Buddhism in order to vomit up the poison in toxin of ignorance, of not knowing, or of attaching, of clinging to things as good and evil, as I and mind. So this is why we come to study Buddhism. So please listen carefully in order to study Buddhism correctly, and then you will be able to free yourself of this poison and enter into the new life. Please calm down any thoughts about this being impossible if you're thinking this way then let that quiet down for a while and give this a chance. Incline your minds to the possibility that this can really happen and then study Buddhism correctly according to the genuine teachings and principles of Buddhism. And once we understand those principles correctly, then we practice them, we apply them correctly. And if this is done, then we all have the chance to live the new life. This is something eminently possible for all of us, so please give it your undivided attention. So now we come to the, the activity of studying. And to do this study correctly, we must all be scientists. So please stop being farmers, merchants, civil servants, bankers, lawyers, doctors, teachers, whatever, and become every one of you scientists. With this attitude, the attitude of the scientist, we will be able to study Buddhism correctly.
We need to give up being philosophers caught up in speculations, opinions, and theories which have no end. We need to give up being psychologists and psychiatrists as they are in the world these days that operate only on theories and become the kind of psychologists and psychiatrists who are true scientists. Give up being logicians and all these other speculative fields and become true scientists who deal with the reality of life. And in this way, we will be able to learn about Buddhism. Buddhism is not a philosophy. It is a science. Although sometimes we may talk about it as a philosophy a little bit here and there, this will not be successful. We need to approach Buddhism as a science. That is the only way that we can be successful in its study. Most people like to study Buddhism as a philosophy, and so they don't have any idea what Buddhism is. They've never come close to what it really is. We have to approach it as a science. So calm down those ideas and tendencies to philosophize and speculate and form opinions, and come at Buddhism with a truly scientific attitude in perspective. If we do this, we will be able to realize Buddhism as it truly is. Even the Buddhism, the approach to Buddhism, which is scientific, has its different levels. We can approach Buddhist science as physical science, psychic science, or spiritual science. But here we're, we need to be primarily interested, especially interested in the spiritual science of Buddhism. So the physical and mental psychical aspects, why not just leave them aside for now to focus our attention on the spiritual aspect, which is crucial for our lives. True science must deal with actual existing objects with real things. Philosophy deals with hypotheses and ideas which are not real. So in Buddhist science, we need to deal with things that are actually happening, with real things occurring within our lives instead of mere hypotheses about our lives. And most of all, we need to study with the reality of dukkha, of suffering, of pain and sorrow within our own lives. We have to take this thing, these things, these realities, and have them arise within our minds clearly, distinctly, directly, and experience them there directly. And then we can investigate them, experiment them, research them, in order to see where these things come from and where they are going. Only in this way can we find any success in our study of Buddhism. Most of all, we have to study right here at this thing called life. We, this is what we have to take up and become clear about and investigate. This life, our, our own lives. But don't be foolish and concentrate on the physical aspects of life. This, this business of living protoplasm and all that in the cells of the body is not very significant. That's not the meaning of human life. That has nothing to do or very little to do with, with Dhamma. Instead, it's the mind, the functions, the behavior, the activity of the mind which takes place within the body or based upon the body. This is what we need to study and investigate if we are going to understand Buddhism. We have to study the activity of mind. The, the subject matter, the raw material of our experiment that we have to bring into our laboratory 
is called the ayatta nika kam, the things that are associated with the ayatana. The ayatana, it's difficult to translate, so we'll just tell you what they are. These ayatta nika tam, there are 30 objects in this, five groups. Each group has six things within it, which makes a total of 30. The first group is the internal ayatana. The internal ayatana are the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, the six inner sense organs or bases. The second group are the external ayatana. These are the sights, sounds, smells, flavors, touches, and mind objects, mental, mental things. These are the six external sense objects. The third group is sense consciousness, vijnana, the basic awareness of the mind towards any sense stimuli. And so there's six kinds of this sense consciousness, that based on the eye, the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. This is the third group of six. The fourth group is the patsa or sense contact. When for any of these three things come together and meet, for example, the eye, a sight, and eye consciousness come together, there is what we call patsa or contact, sense contact. This is when there is a sense experience. And then the fifth group, and there are six kinds of contacts based on the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind again. And then the fifth group are the vetana, the feelings which arise in response, in reaction to the sense activity. And so there are feelings towards eye experience or seeing, towards hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, bodily sensitivity, and then me mental objects. These are the 30 ayata nika tama, or tam, the things associated with the ayatana, the senses. These are the 30 things that you need to know and understand if you're going to study Dhamma or Buddhism. It's the same as we have to know the vowels and consonants first before we can go on and learn how to read and write and all that. So we begin by learning about these ayatana and if we, in order to be able to study Dhamma. To study Dhamma, we need to know these 30 things, these five groups of things. And to know these things means much more than just memorizing their names or noting them down in a notebook or any kind of such intellectual activity. That isn't enough. We have to really know them. And this means to know them through our own experience, to study them as they happen in our lives. In any day, all of these 30 things are occurring, and not just once, but many, many times. We're experiencing these different things each and every day of our life. To know them, we have to observe their activity, their functioning within our lives. We have to experience this fully as it occurs. This is what we must do if we are to study and understand Dhamma. We must observe the, the internal ayatana, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, the external sense objects, the sense consciousness, the sense contact, and the feelings which arise towards all that. This is what we must study as it occurs within the mind. In spiritual matters, in Dhamma, to study something can only take place when it exists within our mind. Otherwise, we're just fantasizing. We're just thinking about things. Instead, we must observe 
the activity of these things as they are occurring within consciousness. This is where we study these 30 things. Each, each day, as they occur over and over again, one after the other, we study this from day to day to day within our own lives and own experience. And this is how we come to understand these 30 things within the experience of our own lives. And this is the basis for our study of Dhamma. These are the things that are happening over and over again all the time, every day of our lives. They're happening every day, but still we don't know anything about them. We haven't really taken any time to study them. We're, we're not even interested in observing what makes up the experience of our lives. So we tend to ignore the reality of these, these 30 things. So let's, let's start to take a look at them, to observe how they work in function. So we start with the inner ayatana, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And then the external ayatana. And we study how they work in function in how vijnana, consciousness, arises. Let's begin just with this. For example, the eye. The eye sees a shape, a form. And then vijnana, eye consciousness, arises. The basic sense awareness, the basic level of mental awareness arises. And then there is seeing. Or there's ear in sound, and then ear consciousness and then nose and smell and nose consciousness, the three coming together. The same happens with the tongue and tastes, the body and touches, and the mind and mental objects. This is the basic reality of our own lives, but we never take any time to observe it. We haven't really gotten interested in this thing. Well, now it's time to study these things. And so we'll start by looking at how the inner ayatana, the outer ayatana, and the vijnana or sense consciousness operate. You need to understand that within the body and the internal ayatana there is a system of nerves. We have a nervous system. And when some external stimulus, such as a form or a sound, makes contact with this nervous system, then there is a reaction, a response that occurs automatically. This happens naturally. It happens by itself. It, has not, it doesn't depend on the existence of a self, an ego, or a soul. It just happens by itself. And this is the beginning of our understanding of anatta, the truth of, of not-self that the basic sense activity, sense stimulus, occurs by itself naturally. It's just a function of our bodies and their nervous systems. And that's all. There's no self or soul involved. And once these, say, the, the internal and the external ayatana come into contact, then there arises the thing we call vijnana, sense consciousness. This consciousness at first isn't there, but once the, say, the eye and a shape come into contact, into relationship, then there arises consciousness, sense consciousness. This sense consciousness comes up by itself once these first two are in, in relationship. This happens naturally. It's just the way things work. And this consciousness itself is no self or soul. It's no atta or atman or ego or whatever you want to call it. They're just things occurring within life. This is the beginning of our understanding of anatta. If you understand the inner ayatana, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, in the external ayatana and the sense consciousness as being Anatta, if you truly understand that through your own experience, then you have understood these three things.
correctly. When you realize that there is just the functions of the nervous system occurring naturally in the eyes, ears, and so forth, and the external sense objects, when you realize this, then you are beginning to see or understand or practice science. If you still think that these things are occurring because of some self or soul or ego or whatever you want to call it, if you have some self view on these things, then it isn't Buddhism at all. Your understanding is not Buddhist, but it is animism instead. But once we see that all this sense activity, the sense organs, the sense objects, the sense consciousness, when we see all, that all this has nothing to do with selves or souls or egos, then we are beginning to practice science. And when, we, when it is becoming science in this way, then we can progress along the correct path and we will move in the, the right direction. Buddhism teaches anatta, or the, the truth, the fact of not-self. This is not a doctrine. It is a truth that we can realize for ourselves. Anatta means that there is nothing that, there is no such thing as a self, as a soul, an ego, a spirit, an atman, um, any of these different things, um, an individual, the person, all these words we use based in an egoistic perspective of, upon life, all these words are, are illusions. They do not point to any true reality. This, this is Buddhism. The Buddha, <clears throat> when he taught, was teaching this truth of anatta. But we should understand that before there was Buddhism, there, were, there was Hinduism or the, the Brahmanistic teachings. Even in India, these teachings existed before the Buddha appeared. And so when the Buddha started teaching about not-self, there was a bit of conflict or contradiction towards the, the standard beliefs of most of the population. And so it was very difficult for many people to understand and accept the truth. But what the Buddha realized was that in order to eliminate suffering from the human mind, in order to free human life from the problem of dukkha, one had to penetrate to the fact of anatta, of not-self. If we're still clinging and grasping and clutching at the belief or the idea of a self or a soul or whatever, then there will always follow dukkha. The mind will be tormented, the mind will suffer because of that attachment, that clinging. When the Buddha saw this, he saw that it was also necessary to teach the truth of anatta. This is the, the genuine truth of Buddhism. Please don't con confuse it with some of the, the Hindu teachings which do not, do not share this understanding. There's something which confuses this whole matter, and this is what people call the astral body. In Buddhism, there is no such thing. There's no teaching about anything called an astral body. It comes from, from someplace else. And this thing that people call an astral body doesn't in itself have any genuine reality. There is merely the consciousness, the awareness of the mind. Or, and then there is also what we now call the subconscious. Now maybe this subconsciousness has been confused with what some people call the astral body or the divine body or whatever. But all there is is consciousness and if you want subconsciousness. But this thing, the astral body, doesn't actually exist. It's, it has no, no place in Buddhism, so please don't drag it in, because if you drag this, this idea in, you'll confuse everything about Buddhism, and you won't be able to understand 
what Buddhism has to offer. So now we've studied the science of the first three things, the internal ayatana, the external ayatana, and vijnana, sense consciousness. These are the first three things, and now we can come to the fourth. The fourth is patsa. Patsa, or sense contact, occurs when these three things we've already mentioned meet and, and function in, in cooperation, in tandem. So there's the internal sense organ, such as the eye, the external sense object, the sight, and then eye consciousness. When these three come together, then there is patsa. We can see this as the as sense consciousness is aware, it, it sees, it knows the object, the sense object, through or dependent upon the sense organ, the sense apparatus. These three functioning together is what we call contact. This contact occurs countless times every day. It's happening all throughout our lives, but still we never pay any attention to it. We haven't studied it and so we don't understand it. Don't many people think it's merely the sense organs and the sense objects doing something, reacting together. If we see it in this way, then we haven't realized what's really going on. It's not just two things, it's three ingredients. There is also the sense conscious, consciousness, the mental aspect. All three of them together is the contact that we need to study and learn about. If we don't understand this thing, then we'll never be able to control it. And if we don't control it, then it will get out of control and lead to all kinds of trouble and dukkha. It will, it will get stirred up into the defilements, into things like greed, anger, confusion, fear, and worry. And so we have to understand this patsa, this contact, in order to be able to control it. If we don't do this, we'll never get a hand on dukkha. This thing called patsa has two, two levels or two stages. And so let's investigate this a bit. When first the eyes see a form, say, the eyes see of the color pink. There is, and then consciousness arises, there is just a material contact. There is contact with the material object, the, the, through the organ, the mind, the consciousness makes contact with the color pink, a certain frequency of, of light waves. This is the first level of contact. It's very simple, very basic. But then the mind will plunge deeper into that experience. The, the contact deepens. And then there is, a con we say, contact with the meaning of the object, such as at first there's just color pink. But then as the contact deepens, there is the meaning of, say, a rose or something pleasant, something agreeable and desirable. And then there is contact with the meaning of the things. This is very important. The one is just a, a very basic level of making contact, of experiencing a mental thing. But the second, which is just a kind of recognition. But then the mind plunges in further, or the contact deepens. And then it, realize, it, it becomes aware of the meaning or value of something. The first kind of contact is called patika sampatsa, patika contact, which is just this basic contact with the material thing. For example, we, it's just like the waves of something, either light waves or sound waves or particles of things floating into the nose or the sense activity on the tongue or physical stimuli in the body, whatever, it's just this kind of thing, the movement of, of waves making contact with the nervous system. Very basic material thing. 
but then it goes deeper into and finds some meaning or value in the thing. For example, seeing a, a human shape, a human form. That's just Bhatika Sampat. But then it deepens into Ati Vajana Sampatsa or Ati Vajana contact, which is to in a human form to see either man or woman and then all of a sudden it has meaning or value depending on the kind of meaning depends on our own perspective but then all of a sudden the experience has meaning and this is the the aspect or level of contact which becomes a problem the first level is just natural and basic and it doesn't involve any problems but this second level doesn't have to, but it often gets out of control and turns into problems for us because of our misunderstanding. So to understand patsa clearly, we should investigate these two levels, the patika, the basic material <coughs> contact, and the atiwajana contact, or the, the contact with the meaning or value of a thing. So when the, there is the first kind of, of contact of patsa, then there is a material value. The mind contacts a material value. When it's the second order of contact, the mind makes contacts a, a thing, the meaning or the value, a mental meaning or value in the thing. The first kind isn't very important. It doesn't, it doesn't get turn into any kind of problems. It's just a basic thing. But the second kind has a lot of meaning and is very important for our understanding of Dhamma and of how the mind works. Now, there's another two things which we need to know about, another two kinds of contact which we need to understand. These are foolish contact and intelligent contact. When the mind is in an ignorant or foolish state and then contact occurs, then that contact is foolish or ignorant. But when the mind is wise, it has knowledge, it's, it's intelligent at the moment of contact, then the contact is called wise contact. This is another crucial distinction for us to investigate. If there is ignorance or which avicca, not knowing or wrong knowing, stupidity, foolishness, ignorance in the mind at the moment of contact, then that contact will also be foolish and it will stir up into suffering, into attachments, into desires, into a variety of, of problems, all happening because that original contact takes place under the influence of ignorance, of foolishness. But at the moment of, if at the moment of contact there is correct knowledge, vicha or wisdom, panya, then, then the contact is intelligent, it's wise, and no problems will result. The ignorant contact will always be harmful. It will always bring some harmful result to our lives. But when the contact is wise, there is no harmful result and then it is possible to make the most of that experience and opportunity. So we should investigate these, the difference between wise contact and ignorant contact. When we say intelligent, don't confuse it with the intellect or think it's merely an intellectual matter. This thing intellect, we, we don't really trust it very much because it can be fooled, it can be deluded. And so we prefer to talk about wisdom, about vicha, correct knowledge, instead of mere intellectual understanding. It's necessary for contact to be wise, for there to be a truly profound and correct understanding of it. When this happens, no problems will result from contact. But if it's merely intellect and intellectual understanding, then although we might have some ideas or opinions about the contact, it, we can still miss the reality, we can still misunderstand, and then this will lead to 
foolish contact which will be lead to all kinds of incorrect activity of mind which turns into dukkha. So be very careful about the difference between wise contact and merely intellectual understanding which can still be foolish. If there is at the moment of contact, if there is mindfulness, the basic the ability of the mind to be completely aware and awake to the experience, if there is this mindfulness, and then there is wisdom, correct knowledge and understanding of the things we need to know, and there is ready comprehension, a comprehensive view as we apply wisdom. If these things are, are all present at the moment of contact, then that contact will be wise. When the contact is wise, the mind doesn't get trapped within good and evil. The mind can be free of these limited conceptions and beliefs. And then that mind is experiencing the new life. But if there's not enough mindfulness, not enough wisdom and ready comprehension at contact, then it is foolish and the mind can be deceived into good and evil, into desires and attachments and this will always lead to dukkha. So be very careful that it is wise contact because wise contact is correct and when it is correct it, it follows the, the right path of life and that is the new life. But if it's foolish contact then it's incorrect and it leads all, to all kinds of problems and suffering. So we need to, to study this difference. We need to examine it in our own experience. So now we'll move on to the, the fifth thing, the feelings. When contact is ignorant, then the resulting feeling will be ignorant. When contact is wise, then the resulting contact will be wise. Let's, let's see what happens with these different kinds of feeling. If at the moment of contact there is a lack of knowledge or wrong understanding, then there arises ignorant, foolish, deluded feeling. And so if the object, the experience is pleasant, then it is taken to be good. Or if the, the object is unpleasant and disagreeable, it is taken to be bad. And so this is how ignorance arises with the feeling. Things are taken to be good and bad. This is where the fruit of that tree is eaten, right here at this moment where ignorant feeling arises. And then as the mind is getting caught within the meaning of good and evil, it attaches to this, and this always leads to dukkha, to suffering, to mental agitation, conflict, and so forth. On the other hand, when it's wise contact, when the sensory contact takes place with wisdom, with correct knowledge, with right understanding, then the feeling is wise, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant or whatever, it's wise. And so the mind sees that, it doesn't see it as good and evil, there's no good and evil. The mind is aware that everything takes place according to its, its own principles, the natural the nature, the natural laws of these things. And instead of discriminating as good and evil, as happens when there is foolishness, the mind just sees things as they are. And so the mind doesn't bite that fruit. And then this wise feeling doesn't become the basis for, for suffering. So examine this. See that how wise feeling or how ignorant feeling arises and how it leads to the foolish discrimination of things as good and evil and then all the problems that that leads to. Or on the other hand, the why, how wise feeling arises and how that doesn't lead to any problems. When it's wise feeling, the mind continues to function correctly. No problems are stirred up. The mind doesn't make mistakes. And so it is free. It's free of the burden of good and evil. It's free of all suffering. This is how the feelings work. So what do you think? Were Adam and Eve born when God made the world or soon after? 
or were Adam and Eve born when you were born from your mother's womb? What do you think? If you think Adam and Eve were born when God created the world, please raise your hand. If you think Adam and Eve were born at the moment of your own birth, please raise your hand. Nobody knows anything. <laughs> if Adam and Eve were born when God created the world, then it's not that significant for us because it happened a very long time ago. But when they say that original sin has been passed on down through all the generations of human history until this moment, that is, is quite frightening. In reality, in truth, Adam and Eve are born at the moment we are born from our mother's womb. This is the birth of Adam and Eve. And then because of a lack of knowledge, because when we're, when we're infants, soon after birth, we don't have any understanding of, of life, of how the world works. We are ignorant, we're, we're lacking in knowledge and wisdom. And so we discriminate things as good and evil and get caught up in all that mess. The young infant, all infants, including ourselves, we, we don't have the knowledge. And so when there's a pleasant, when something agrees with us, when we're a little child, when something agrees with us, we thought it was good. We discriminated it as good. And when something disagreed with us, we categorized it as evil. And this, this became a habitual response and has carried on throughout the rest of our lives. The moment of original sin occurs right there when the child discriminates what are merely pleasant and unpleasant feelings into good and evil. That's the original sin that leads to spiritual death. As soon as the infant has developed enough that it is possible for patsa, for contact, to occur when the, the sense organs in the nervous system is sufficiently developed for patsa to occur, for contact, then there will arise feelings and then original sin takes place where the infant discriminates good and evil. This good and evil that we get caught in at such an early age is really a mess. Good causes all kinds of troubles and problems and hassles and fuss of one kind. And then evil has all the troubles and hassles and fuss of evil. It's a real mess. It keeps our minds always burning and boiling and bubbling throughout our lives. It's much better to be free of all this good and evil, to transcend it, to be beyond it, to be out from under the power of good and evil. And so this is why we study this, this matter of contact and vetana. This, this is the original sin. This is the Adam and Eve that is of the greatest importance to each and every one of us, even if we're not Christians. All we say is that when the infant is born and then it, the sense apparatus is functioning, then it will have us, there will arise contact and there will be a point where the child discriminates what is pleasant or what is unpleasant. And then because of ignorance, turns that into positive and negative, which becomes good and evil and leads to all the various problems and hassles or suffering of our lives. Before that moment, although there is the child is alive, before the child makes that discrimination between agreeable and disagreeable or likable and unlikable, before that moment there's no problem. But as soon as that distinction, the separation occurs between pleasant and unpleasant, then that grows into positive and negative, good and evil, and then the human, the infant's mind becomes trapped within the limitations, the, the foolishness of good and evil. This, neither of these are peaceful. Neither good nor evil is peaceful for the mind. It bubbles and boils 
within the mind. And so God, God out of great pity for mankind, had the intention to warn mankind. And so God said, don't eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you will die. God warned mankind way back in the beginning, but because of our stubbornness and stupidity, we've ignored the warning. Buddhism has the same intention to save mankind from all that suffering, but very few people seem to be interested. All of us now have not heeded the warning, and so we have eaten this fruit. And so the situation we are in is, if we are wise enough, is how are we going to vomit up this poison fruit? How are we going to cough it up and spit it up in order to be free of this? What we must do is we, can, we have to study and observe and learn how this good and evil, the positivism and negativism, arises. And we do that by studying these 30 ayatana, ayatanika tam, ayatanika tam. If we study these and understand them, then we will know how good and evil arises. And with that knowledge, we can free ourselves from their power and influence. And then the mind is free, life is at peace, and that is the meaning of new life. Now let's talk about it from in childish terms instead of in the preceding scientific terms. Let's talk in very simple terms of gladness and sadness. These things, gladness and sadness, do you think there's any difference between them? Most people think there is, and this shows that they haven't understood them yet. Once we understand sadness and gladness, we'll see that there's really no difference between the two. If we're glad, if we're really glad and carried away with being glad and happy, then we're unable to sleep and food doesn't taste very good. When we're sad, when we're lost in sadness, well, we can't sleep either and food doesn't taste very good as well. When we're caught up in these things like gladness, these things gladness and sadness, then it makes it impossible to sleep and to eat food in a pleasant way. But when the mind is free of both gladness and sadness, then it's very easy to sleep and food always tastes good. These are very simple way to look at it. Sadness and gladness or good become lead to good and evil and this enslaves us. And so that's why God warned mankind to not eat the fruit that leads to the knowledge, the knowing of good and evil. Through that knowledge, we become enslaved to good and enslaved to evil. And that is a very heavy burden to bear. When we're enslaved in this way, there's no freedom. When, when we're enslaved to good, it leads to all kinds of toil and desires and struggle after the good. And when enslaved to evil, it leads to all kinds of toil and desires and struggle to get away from the evil. And this is nothing but enslavement and suffering. Why not, why not get out of that enslave, slave, enslavement? Why not become liberated to be free of good and evil, where the mind is still and calm? When the mind is trapped within good and evil, there's no calmness and no peace. The mind is never at ease. But when still and calm and free of good and evil, the mind is at peace and at ease. You ought to see which one of these is more worth, worth living. The one that is worth living is the meaning of new life. We, by now, or <clears throat> everyone is probably willing to accept that all human beings in the world like 
things that are good and pleasant, like gladness, pleasantness, happiness, positiveness. We can all accept that this is what everyone likes. But when we like these things, then we want them and we chase after them, we become enslaved to them, and then we aren't free. On the other hand, nobody likes things that are evil, that are unpleasant, that are negative. And so we try to get away from these things, and in that way, we get caught up with and enslaved by negativism, by, by evil. If we were just aware of these evil things without getting caught up in the meaning, getting trapped within the meaning of this word evil, then there would be no problem and the mind would remain free. But because of our foolishness, we get trapped within the meanings of these words good and evil. And this leads us around by the nose endlessly. So why not study these matters and see, see what the situation is and learn how to be free of all the suffering, all the pain created by this enslavement to good and evil. God warned us a long, long time ago in one sentence, but, but we haven't listened. And so we need to start over again and, and examine the situation. The old life is the life that is caught up in good and evil, which is entrapped by them and which suffers because of that. That's the old life. But when the life, when life understands, when we understand these things called good and evil, and then no longer have the foolish knowledge that entraps, but have genuine wisdom regarding good and evil, so that we are either in the middle, not caught up in these extremes of good and evil, or above good and evil. This doesn't mean this means that the mind, when it is above them, that it is free of them and no longer trapped by them. And then this is the meaning of new life. We told you in the beginning that if you studied Buddhism correctly, then re the result would be the new life that is free of positivism and negativism, that is not trapped by good and evil. So please study this matter carefully. If you are a good Christian, then you will not be enslaved by good and evil. And if you're a good Buddhist, then you will not be enslaved by good and evil either. We have taken some time to compare these two, to, to understand what it is like when the mind is free of good and evil. We have been studying, looking for this point of commonality between Christianity and Buddhism in order that we can work together to, for us all to transcend good and evil, for us all to transcend suffering. And so we have made this comparison in the spirit of friendship and mutual understanding. If you're a good Christian, then you'll be a good Buddhist also, if you've been understanding what we've been talking about. And if you're a good Buddhist, you'll be a good Christian as well. Now, if you don't agree with that, that's up to you. But this is how we see things, and this has been our intention in talking as we have today, in order for us to work together, to cooperate, so that we can all get free of the enslavement to good and evil, so that we all may have new life. If we're going to be a good Buddhist and a good Christian, then we have to be able to control the thing we call patsa, or sense contact. If we can't control patsa, then there's no way we can be good Christians and good Buddhists, because when we don't control sense contact, we'll always get enslaved in good and evil. So let's study this matter carefully so that we have sufficient understanding in order to control sense contact. And then we'll all be both good Christians and good Buddhists. And so this is why we've been talking about this matter. And we'll, in the next talk, 
will examine these issues further. Okay. To summarize all this about Patsa, we've got a little slogan or verse that we like and we hope the translator can get it right. <clears throat> Suffering is born in the mind because we err at Patsa. Dukkha is born in the mind because we err, that is, make a mistake, at Patsa. Dukkha won't shoot up if we're not stupid during Patsa. Dukkha can't arise if we understand the matter of Patsa. We'll go through the verse again. Dukkha doesn't arise in the mind. Dukkha arises in the mind because we err at Patsa. Dukkha won't shoot up if we're not stupid at Patsa. We won't be stupid at Patsa if we understand the matter or the story of Patsa. So, to summarize, it is necessary for us as, as human beings to understand this matter of Patsa fully and correctly in order to control it, to keep it within safe and healthy limits. If we can't control it, if we are still foolish about this matter, then it will always lead into getting caught up, into being enslaved to good and evil. And then our life is trapped within these limitations, and that is dukkha, is suffering, is conflict, and so <clears throat> forth. So this is the subject matter that we ought to pay a special attention to if we are going to understand Buddhism correctly and realize the fruit of new life. And this is, this is where the, the story, the matter, finishes. So now you've been sitting for a long time and your bodies are feeling stiff and tired. And so the influence of good and evil is starting to arise. And so we better end now. If you're, if you're interested, come back tomorrow and we'll discuss Patsa, this matter of Patsa, in more detail in order to be the master of sense contact.